Good to go? I think we're ready to go. So, hello everyone, a warm welcome and thank you all for being here with us at the Grand Halle in Paris and also at your screens back home all over the world. This is the session on financing the ecological and social transition how to reform capitalism. My name is Nora Müller. I head the International Affairs Department at the Kerber Stiftung in Berlin, and we are a very proud co-founding member of the Paris Peace Forum. Build back better. This has not only been the slogan of the Biden campaign, but has also become a mantra, a mantra on how to rebuild and restructure our economies in the post-pandemic world. But now we are, what, 20 months or so into the pandemic and what's nowhere in sight really is exactly this great reset. Still, with the pandemic still going on, with the climate crisis, with growing inequalities all over the world, I think it is fair to say that there is really no going back to the status quo ante. Or is there, after all? Well, the question on how to reform capitalism is probably as old as capitalism itself. So let's see whether on this panel we will come up with some fresh ideas, which I think we will, because we have a stellar lineup here with us on the panel and also online. Please join me in welcoming to my left here Odile Renaud Basso, the, well, I think it's fair to say the still new president of the EBRD who has joined us from London. Good to have you with us. And on the very far side, um, on, on the very, very far left side, I should say, but not politically, Sir Alan Parker. Um, he is the chairman and the founder of Brunswick, which was at some point dubbed as a critical issues firm. Very good to have you. Now, let me also go to our panelists online. I am very pleased to be joined from Cairo, Egypt, by Dr. Hala El Said, who is the Minister of Planification and Economic Development. And she is also the winner of the Arab Government Excellence Award. I didn't know there is a, a thing like this, but she did get this award, which was established by Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, the ruler of Dubai. Minister, great to have you with us. I am particularly pleased, I have to say, that we're also joined by two project leaders who present their projects here at the Paris Peace Forum. Please join me in welcoming Naina Batra. The, Naina is the CEO of the Asian Venture Philanthropy Network, AVPN, which is a social investment network. And um, here at the Paris Peace Forum, she presents a project called Collaborative Philanthropy for Social Impact. And Naina, I'm sure you'll be talking about this a little later on. I'm also happy and delighted to see Sandeep Farias here on the screen. Sandeep is the founder and a managing partner of Elevar Equity, another social investment firm focusing very much on work in low-income countries. Um, 
Sandeep is also here to talk a little bit, a little more about the Elevar method of investing and what that method exactly is, we will learn later on in the conversation. And last but certainly not least, I am very happy and honored to have Jeffrey Sachs with us. Jeffrey Sachs is, as you know, the president of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network. He's also the director of the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University. And re recently I, I wrote in the Financial Times um, that Jeffrey has had a knack for placing himself at the heart of urgent economic, economic policy issues throughout his career. Um, this is probably true and this is also why we're very happy to have him on this panel. So great to have you all with us. Now, before we start, I have to do a bit of housekeeping. Um, we only have 60 minutes. We have six speakers. That means um, time is really of the essence. So I can all only implore all of you to be very concise. Um, I also have a bag full of questions for all of you, um, but I do want to encourage our guests and audience here in the hall, but also online to submit your questions and join the conversation. I have an iPad here. I will receive your questions and I will do my best to kind of juggle these two worlds. Now, I would like to start with Professor Sachs, in fact. Um, he will have to run a little earlier, I understand, um, uh, in, in half an hour's time or so. So Professor Sachs, if I, if I could bring you into the conversation first. I've come across an article that you wrote a while ago in which you argued that we have to bring back virtue into um, the field of economics. Now, virtue is not necessarily a term that you would associate with economics, but rather with morals. Why do you still think that we have to uh, work towards a comeback of virtue in the field of economics? Uh, well, it's, it's precisely because we don't associate the term virtue in economics that we better bring it back. Uh, economics lost its way because economics should be about pursuing the common good, uh, not simply about uh, making uh, the maximum uh, profit uh, at any moment. And uh, certainly uh, Wall Street uh, lost its way on that. Uh, Wall Street's metrics uh, are money in the bottom line, not the common good. But let me say uh, broadly about our topic. Um, there are many facets of financing this uh, transition to sustainable development. And if you would permit me, I would just like to differentiate a few quick concepts because I think it's extremely important that we have the, the whole picture. Many things that need to be done must be done by governments, not by markets. Uh, we lose sight of that because a lot of the discussion is about what should market participants do. But we need governments to provide vital services such as education for all, health care for all, a, a safe uh, infrastructure for all. And we should not pretend that market forces uh, are going to deliver that. Once we recognize that, there's another very important concept, and that is that poor countries do not have the budget revenues to achieve all of these goals that have been set out, whether it's the Sustainable Development Goals or the Paris Agreement. And so either we have mechanisms to provide more fiscal space, more revenues for governments in poor countries, or we will have a disastrous continuing widening of inequality between the rich and the poor. There are hundreds of millions of children not in school in poor countries. There are hundreds of millions of people without adequate nutrition. There are hundreds of millions of, or billions. Uh, there are hundreds of millions or billions of people without access to basic public services. And their governments do not have the revenues 
to account for this. So we spend a lot of time talking about the trillions in the private capital markets. And of course, that money should be better invested. But what we don't speak about is the fact that we need a global fiscal financial system, global taxation, taxation of the super wealthy, for example, taxation of carbon that is then used to open up fiscal space for poor countries so that they can provide basic services. Otherwise, we won't make it. And I'll just uh, end uh, this brief uh, statement by saying the rich countries are not serious about this. They don't even recognize the problem. Uh, the happy talk about $100 trillion of private capital is irrelevant for many parts of this challenge that I've just mentioned. Unless we get serious about redirecting wealth on the planet through fiscal means so that governments in poor countries can carry out basic investments and public services, we will continue to be disappointed, if I could put it that way, uh, just as we are at COP26 and as we were at the G20 a couple of weeks ago. We are not serious about what we're doing in the sense that we have all these exalted goals, but we do not seriously, the rich countries in particular, my country worst of all, look together with developing countries at how to achieve the goals that we have set. And it is in this sense, tragic to have these high aspirations, which are so important, which need virtue to uh, identify the right thing to do, but then not to identify the financial means to bring this about. And this to my mind is the central failing of our global governance. We don't put the money behind the commitments. And until we do so, our world is going to be not only unstable, but increasingly destabilized. Professor Sachs, thank you very much. And while I ask for a little technical help here because my, my in-ear device has uh, some problems, I will turn to our colleagues here on the panel. And um, so, Ellen, I wanted to start with you and very much to follow up on what Professor Sachs was just saying. Um, when we talk about reforming capitalism, this is definitely not a new idea. And there have been a number of attempts to produce a better version of capitalism, and many of them actually failed. Now, this time around, though, there seems to be a different sort of atmosphere, um, also in the sense that big business seems to realize that only maximizing shareholder value seems to be not the smartest of things. Um, what is your sense? Are we really at a genuine turning point at this point in time? Thank you. I, I think we may well be, I think echoing Professor Sachs's words, the question is whether we realize where we are actually. And are we actually taking it seriously enough? Because I think that's the challenge to the system. Um, I think that it really is a question of what you're asking, um, your outcomes, what the desired outcomes you're really looking for out of capitalism and the markets. In almost every country in the world, we are a mixed economy, actually. And the question is, what is the role of government and what is the role of markets? Now, uh, I completely agree. The great problem is we have not been investing in common goods. We have not seen the real risks of inequality. We are now beginning to. COVID has surfaced it in a pretty vicious way. Climate change is going to surface it more. Um, our capital market ethos has been that, strangely enough, just maximizing profit was some kind of common good. <laughs> there was some version of greed is good because it'll sort of, you know, it'll trickle down, it'll work. I think we are at a time when people are having more conversations. I completely applaud the Paris Peace Forum in raising it because there are not enough places. 
Now, I think it is quite... I mean, the, the real issue is, are we debating what we want the outcomes to be? Mm. If we want those outcomes to be along the lines Professor Sachs has raised, then what is the role of business? The encouraging thing is that we are... Uh, seeing business as having a greater role rather than just creating profits for its equity capital holders. It has moved to a multi-stakeholder world. They are taking on different responsibilities. But it, this is the beginning of a journey for business, and business has got to recognise that. We are, we've got a long way to go because I do believe we are set, resetting its role in society. It cannot take the position and should not think it can take the position of government, but it can take a much more significant role, it has to recognise the true externalities, it has to be much clearer uh, of, uh, of externalities of, of what it does in many, many ways, it has to be much clearer about what it is trying to achieve at a social um, and, and political level in that Sorry, Ellen, if I may come in here, um, the question of um, what does big business actually try to achieve? Some cynics actually say that this whole transition from shareholder capitalism to stakeholder capitalism is only a big PR stunt to make big business look better, to improve its somewhat tainted image. Would you say, oh, that's really pure cynicism or is there a grain of truth in this? I think it would be odd if there wasn't cynicism given the track record of a particularly big business globally in a lot of ways. Um, we have, you know, we've created a huge amount of prosperity out of it from uh, business and enterprise over the last 30, 50 years or more, but at a huge cost. There's no doubt about that. Um, and I think to transition is not an easy thing. Right now, though, um, you are seeing a change that is certainly unlike anything I've seen in my career of... Uh, people recognising that it is no longer about just making money. There is not a major board in the world that I see and deal with that really believes that it is not that you are decreasing the demand to perform financially, but the other demands, the societal issues, they have to perform at too. And that is the change. And you'd be very brave as a board or as a chief executive now not to recognise that. Sitting in Glasgow, we were talking earlier, you know, there is nowhere to hide now. The reporting is going to be there on climate change. It's just the beginning, but it is really coming. You have the same on diversity, the same on inclusion, you have the same on a huge range of social issues. So it would be a, it, deeply unwise for a chief executive to think that they are not going to be incredibly important. Because after all, you know, if you fail financially, it will take two or three years before they come and suggest you might change your job. You fail on these issues right now, you could be out almost immediately. Mm -hmm. So this is broken into the boardroom. I would also say it isn't just the boardroom making these changes. I think the boardroom table is very important. I think the kitchen table is very important. They are feeling business is changing from the next generation pressure. You can see it in politics, you can see it in the elections, you can see it in business itself. And there's no business that can believe it's going to be a future winner now if it's not going to recruit the best talent. You are not going to recruit that talent if you haven't got real policies on climate change, on diversity, on inclusion, and having a version and vision of yourself in society, not just as a separate entity to make profits for shareholders. So that sounds like we're really at an important inflection point. Um, Madam President, let me go over to you and ask you. I mean, the EBRD is at its 30th anniversary, I understand, is really um, a classical development investment bank. So in that sense, when we reflect about changing, reforming capitalism, it wouldn't it be right to say that the EBRD to some extent is rather part of the problem than part of the solution being sort of a an integral part of this conventional um, financial architecture. I, I, I really believe that a bank like EBRD and other multilateral development banks are much more part of the solution than part of the problem. And when you look at the EBRD mandate, it was created at the collapse of the Soviet Union with a view to help the transition of post-communist countries towards uh, market economies. But um, so at progressively, we extended we extended what means transition, and it's not only transition to capitalism, but it's also transition to um, include um, issues like sustainability. And 
in the very, since the very beginning, in the core mandate, EBRD had always this issue of sustainability, which has progressively take, being, becoming more and more important, and now it's really, it's really at the core of what we are doing. Because the, I mean, our activity and our mandate is really to finance projects in emerging developing countries um, with a view to bring bo both um, effectiveness, market dimension, supporting the private sector development. Uh, and I think that I very much believe and agree with what uh, Professor Sachs said that having sound infrastructure, good public services, strong education, and so forth is absolutely key. But also having a framework that allows entrepreneurship, um, growing activities, uh, private sector to develop is also very important. But in the way you develop the private sector, you can bring a lot of um, social impact, environmental impact. And what we are really aiming to do is to, for example, support private investors in the field of um, the green transition. And to do that, working both with the government and with private investors, for example, to design a regulatory framework which is favorable for renewable investment with auction mechanism that will uh, create incentives so as to get the lower price for developing wind or solar plant in a, in a country, in the most transparent uh, open framework which will, be, uh, which will attract uh, private sector financing and then that will be that will help at the, at the same time um, growing activity um, um, growth in GDP creating jobs and so forth and um, supporting uh, the green transition so I think we have a very important role to play in uh, accompanying the countries in which we intervene to design the right policies and both to attract investment uh, facilitate the development of private activity and also ensure that the, what we finance will be supportive to um, um, equal opportunities, gender equality, and, um, and the green transition. Let me take another example. We work a lot in um, the transport, for example, public transport in some countries with uh, two objectives, greening them, so with uh, more electric buses or clean buses or uh, metros uh, lines, but also bringing this gender dimension and or this equal opportunities dimension. And in a number of countries, for example, we've been investing with very strong policy dialogue with the authorities and I have very example in very very recent example in Kazakhstan where we convinced the government to get rid of a regulation that was forbidding women to work in 200 profession and we use our financial leverage our investment to develop to contribute to this uh, very important transition, both on the social and uh, environmental dimension. That's super interesting, and that's also the perfect lead over to bring in Sandeep. Sandeep is also sort of um, at the very heart of multi-stakeholderism, if you will. Sandeep, um, listening to, to what Odile just said, tell us a little bit uh, more about your work, and in particular, I wanted to ask you to give us a sense what the Elevar method of investing is really all about no thank you for this opportunity and for me to share my thoughts i uh, was listening with a degree of fascination to with the different thoughts being expressed so far and i think it's very important uh, that we not take a view that one solution is required and uh, as opposed to another solution i think the problem that we're facing in the world of inequality inequity a lack of access uh, to basic services, essential services, is so profound and so comprehensive that we need different solutions and need all of these solutions to work. So let me step back. Uh, Who is Elevar? We're an early stage equity investor. We make investments in early stage companies in India and Latin America that are delivering essential services uh, to lower income communities. Uh, by low income, uh, we're obviously not able to go to the poorest of the poor because their ability to pay for these essential services uh, does not exist. And so in some respects, we're going to the entrepreneurial communities within them. We're going to the aspirational uh, low-income community to be able to figure out what kind of services that we can deliver. So far, we've invested in about 40 odd companies that have reached over 40 million households, and I would stress households, uh, because that means in terms of the number of people, there's a greater degree of coverage. Uh, the Elevar method ultimately and the approach that we've taken, and I think it cuts 
to a potential idea that is worth considering. Much of the debate about the financial system and capitalism tends to focus on left versus right. Uh, it tends to focus on structures. It tends to focus on systems. Uh, and I think it's important that we also just, in very, very simple terms, think about it as a set of incentives uh, and think about these incentives bottom up. So take, for example, our work. When we started, we saw a simple problem. This was almost two decades ago, that you could not solve any problem on the ground unless you address the issue of capital and finance. And so much of our initial work was in financial services, putting money in the hands of people to catalyze their livelihoods and their entrepreneurial activity. Over time, it became obvious that finance and capital was a necessary condition, but not a sufficient condition. Uh, we needed to do more. So of course, the finance sector and the world of capitalism needs to be transformed. There's just no doubt about that. And so as we think forward, we started to say we needed to address these issues of lack of access and inequity. And so our own entrepreneurial journey as an investor, we moved our emphasis from the sale of a particular kind of a product, let's say a microfinance product or a small business loan. And we started to think about a solution-oriented approach. Again, in very, very simple terms, maybe the world of business calls it a cross-sell. Uh, but in our, in our work, you start with one particular product or service uh, you may be able to get your margins to a point where you have a reasonably sustainable, profitable business, but then that gives you the opportunity to be able to layer on an additional product or service, and then over time, a third and a fourth, uh, fundamentally because you're focused on a solution at the household level. And so let's just break this down. What are the incentives we're talking about and what do we focus on? Firstly, at a very basic level, we want to dramatically increase the velocity of trades and trans transactions within local communities. Secondly, we want to leverage capital to include players outside the formal economy currently and help them and incentivize them to come into the formal economy because then the pie significantly increases. The size of the economy considerably increases. And once they enter the formal economy, then they get access to a range of additional products and services which make a lot of sense. So the Elevar method of impact investing, if you will, is very, very bottom up. We spend an incredible amount of time in the field. It's almost immersive, trying to understand the needs and aspirations of these communities. And from there, answering the question whether a business model is capable of delivering that product or service which makes a difference or that solution which makes a difference to low-income communities. And we have to do that affordably. Uh, so in that respect, impact investing is very, very different from regular capital or regular uh, investing because you're not focused on the maximization of margins, but you're focused on the affordability of margins. And that is So then very... if we have to get the returns, then we have to scale. Scale becomes our impact imperative and our com commercial imperative. That... And so that's essentially the work that we do. We go on early and scale companies. Thank you so much, Sanjay. That's, That's a very interesting point. And let me carry this train of thought forward to, to Naina Batra. Naina, I've come across a, something very interesting that you said. You said that venture philanthropy or impact investing are in fact concepts that are alien for most people in Asia. And still, um, people that you work with um, are not into labels like, you know, being a venture philanthropist or an impact investor, but they actually do care about tools and practices. And that very much ties up also with what Sandeep was saying about the, the bottom-up approach. Against this backdrop, can you tell us what your vision is for this sector in Asia? Um, thank you. And, you know, uh, absolutely. I, I think in Asia, it's a very, very nascent market for impact investing or venture philanthropy. These are primarily Western terms that, you know, a lot of Asian investors don't necessarily like to label themselves by. I think they take um, investment decisions because they make good business sense. And uh, given that the markets that they, that they work in, um, good business sense actually also sometimes has um, very, very strong social impact. I mean, going back to the discussion that, that you know, we started with in this panel, the 
you know, it's not just about poor countries. Um, Asia Pacific as a region has the fastest growing wealth anywhere in the world, but yet it is not on track to achieve any of the 17 sustainable development goals by 2030. In fact, on its current trajectory, the region may achieve less than 10% of the SDG targets. So the you know, and, and with the pandemic that we've all just gone through and the worsening effects of climate change, um, Asia has probably the most uh, number of climate related disasters as compared to anywhere else um, in the globe. So I think it's um, it's it's interesting as a network what we do with our with our members. We have about 650 odd members that kind of span different categories uh, from philanthropists to uh, corporates, to institutional investors, to even those who call themselves impact investors. And I think it's, you know, for us, in order to sort of look at whether it's transforming the financial sector in order to achieve the SDGs, or it's really looking at, um, you know, business with, with purpose or profit with purpose, as Alan was talking, it's not possible to do this without a multi-sectoral involvement. And in order to do that, AVPN provides a platform for different types of leaders coming from different silos who may not otherwise collaborate together to find partnership, to find collaborative, you know, collaborative interests, and also champ become champions for critical issues in the region. And I think, you know, here's where uh, the project that uh, that we got recognized at the Paris Peace Forum was the first kind of collaborative pooled fund of its kind in Southeast Asia. And the reason it was the first one of its kind is the the funders who came together hadn't were not the ones who had really collaborated. So we had private equity firms that came together with large corporates that came together with private foundations and all of them looking at providing unrestricted core funding, so catalytic money to organizations, Asian organizations on the ground who were coming up with Asian solutions with regards to healthcare delivery. So I think, you know, that's where it's it's really important. And we need to look at all of these different types of facets. Who are the different players we bring in? I mean, uh, Professor Sachs talked about the role of government. The role of government is definitely important, but a lot of governments don't have access to that kind of funding or are not really ne uh, necessarily being able able to, um, you know, find uh, enough investment to actually carry forward some of the innovative um, steps that are needed. And that's where government and investors can actually come in. And, you know, AVPN as a platform brings policymakers together with private sector funders, where they can actually match um, you know, some of their projects with an innovative financing solution, whether that be a pay by performance uh, instrument or whether that actually be investing as um, catalytic money into a project or coming in, um, you know, by providing a guarantee or providing a risk assurance. So I think we need to look at how we can address some of these issues um, in a collaborative manner, in a multi-stakeholder manner, because otherwise um, it's, it's, it's not going to happen. And I believe that transforming the financial sector is only one aspect of the change that we need. But it's, it's a very, very important aspect. And I think investors, especially post the pandemic, have realized that uh, you know, they want to significantly integrate ESG issues, sustainability issues into their decision making. Uh, uh, you know, sort of process. And if you look at it, the, the amount of investment, especially in the Asia Pacific region, in healthcare, in education, in financial inclusion has gone up significantly in the last 18 months. And that is going to obviously have an overall positive impact. That is definitely the case. Naina, thank you very much. And I'm very grateful for you to mention again the role of the state in this multi-sectoral, multi-stakeholder setup that you've been talking about. And that is a perfect opportunity to bring in Dr. Hala from Cairo, Egypt. Dr. Hala, as a Minister for Planification and Economic Development, what's your thinking about um, the public sector, in fact, when it comes to um, fostering a, especially a sustainable economic recovery post-pandemic, I think I should mention that your country, Egypt, um, 
has been able to maintain positive growth even during the the time of the coronavirus crisis so so what's your take on that question <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, and it's a great pleasure to be joining the uh, Paris Peace Forum for the second time. And uh, let me start by saying a few messages. As you said, as you mentioned, the role of the public sector and the role of the government is very important. And uh, uh, today, when we start by saying that the, there is a narrative that increasing the role of the government uh, is crowding out private investment, I think this is not true. The role of the government whether in development or in achieving uh, infrastructure or in transforming to green uh, recovery and green economy should and does not mean crowding out private sector. But the government has a duty and a mandate towards its citizen, whether in eradicating poverty or uh, uh, in preparing the sustainable development for the future and in achieving its sustainable development goals. Uh, the government also is, uh, um, as a partner, is essential to the private sector because the government has, uh, as what we call, a patient capital. So this patient capital, whether from the public investment that the government provides or we provide through the Ministry of Planning and Economic Development, or from its state-owned banks, or indirectly through borrowing locally or international from the international market always uh, uh, can invest in renewables, which has a long uh, span, like, of course, we talk about renewables or wind turbines. All this has usually more than 25 years uh, for uh, uh, the lifespan of these projects. So patience is required in order to spare the innovation needed in activities such as uh, renewables and uh, uh, other projects. The other thing is that uh, private sector, it is quite evident that private sector, when they partner with the government, they are always uh, can incur uh, um, risk, they can involve in risk projects. So pi public-private partnership is also uh, very important and we can co-invest in projects and in Egypt we have a very uh, um, prominent example uh, whether in renewables like uh, the Bemban project, which is the largest solar uh, power uh, plant uh, in the world, which has been done through public-private partnership, or the projects that we are doing currently through the Sovereign Fund of Egypt, which is an investment arm of the government, but its main role is to crowd in private sector, not to crowd out uh, the private sector. We have a lot of projects that we're doing through the Sovereign Fund of Egypt, uh, like uh, localizing of industries, like uh, projects that we're doing now in uh, the green hydrogen. Uh, all these projects are very important. The other thing is that the government also has an important role to play as a regulator, as a regulator in order to uh, redesign some of the financial instruments that uh, can uh, become um, um, to allocate and to regulate uh, uh, for the financial sector in order to get and spur in more green funds uh, and getting uh, financial institutions like the central bank, the financial regulatory authority uh, to reward green banking and green financial sector. Uh, the other and the final thing that I'd like to say is that the green transition, what we're talking today, and we're just coming from uh, the COP26 uh, 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 yesterday, and a green transition uh, should not come at the expense of macroeconomic stability and the development of these countries. Uh, Egypt uh, uh, and most, uh, although Egypt is most vulnerable to uh, climate change, but also all these countries and all developing, developing countries have the right ambition uh, to grow their economies, to achieve their sustainable development goals. So when, when we raise the, raise the ambition, and of course all of us aspire a better transition and better green economy, but this should not come at the cost of uh, the development of these countries and achieving their sustainable development goals of the countries. So uh, uh, if we raise the ambition, this should come through financial support, through investment, and not also uh, through uh, more debts, 
because uh, as you know, after the pandemic, most of the countries in the region, in the African context, uh, continent specifically, and the developing countries, their debts have soared due to the pandemic. So uh, any ambition uh, should come uh, through investment uh, with these countries uh, in order to be able for these countries to eradicate their poverty and to achieve their sustainable uh, development. That's a major, major point. Thank you very much, Minister. And um, if I could ask you to, to, to stay with us here for a moment, because I have a very interesting question on exactly that point um, from our audience here. Um, and let me read it out to you. When we talk about making our economies greener, the ultimate challenge is to distribute the cost also of decarbonization in our societies. What does that mean for a middle income country like Egypt, for example? I think that's probably the question of all questions. So what's your, your um, take on that? Started on an institutional setup. You know, this is, this is a quite important for us. And of course, uh, when we, as a Ministry of Planning, uh, uh, our main goal is to restore our resources for future generations. That's the main role of the state and for the government uh, of Egypt. So uh, it's very important that we have an institutional setup. That's why we started uh, two years ago having a sort of uh, what we called environmental sustainability guidelines. So we started having projects in the investment plan uh, for Egypt, 15% were uh, abiding by these sustainability guidelines last year. We doubled these projects this year to reach 30%. We're aiming to reach also 50% uh, um, uh, by the year 24-25. Another important uh, institutional framework that we uh, have done is uh, we started also through a, a huge initiative that we have done uh, in our country, which is upgrading the quality of life for more than 50% of our population. And this is done through public investment and also through civil society investments. This is, and the private sector. This project, I think, is the largest development projects worldwide because we're targeting 58 million people to upgrade the life of these people through sustainable development projects. Infrastructure, desalination of water, sanitation projects, uh, uh, gas, uh, uh, um, introducing uh, gas to the housing, having sustainable houses for these people, having small and medium uh, uh, enterprises like the bi biogas, uh, um, uh, micro and small enterprises for the people living in these rural areas. and. Also, this project should be implemented uh, on a scale of about three years. This will achieve or this incorporates the 17 sustainable development goals. And as I said, it's one of the uh, largest project, uh, projects worldwide. And it is going to uh, upgrade and uh, impact about 58, 80 million citizens with a cost estimated till now at about 45 billion US dollars. So uh, we issued also green bonds and we were the first country in the region to issue green bonds with about 750 million US dollars in addition to our private sector bank uh, was also one of the first banks in the region to issue about between 120 to 200 million uh, also a green bonds uh, going to be the first private green bonds to be issued. Dr. Halim, thank you very much. And if you all agree, I want us to focus for the rest of, of this conversation on the economics and um, climate nexus. Um, Odile, you've just come back from, from Glasgow. If I can ask you, are you satisfied with the results of Glasgow? I mean, I think there are some positive elements and um, and uh, what was mentioned before for example the involvement of the private sector the commitments from a very large uh, number of big financial institutions representing 130 billion trillions that with a commitment to become uh, net neutral in carbon um, in the future but I these think are pledges right this is pledges but when you, when you are a financial institution and you make such pledge then you have you will be pushed 
pushed and you will have to implement the mechanism that will ensure because you have you are very, I mean you have some accountability issues with your shareholders and so forth so it's a beginning of a mechanics and it's a beginning of a big transformation I think so it's it's not I mean as such it's an announcement it's a trend but I think it's an important movement and um, I'm sure you. I'm sure you've seen that following this announcement. I mean, the, all the issue about how you. I mean, you are accountable and transparent to, um, uh, and how to ensure that this will be implemented will will be at the core of the discussion. But I'm um, convinced that this is a big big change. Um, of course, there are a lot of things and a lot of challenge ahead of us, and the discussions are still ongoing on. Uh, and we were. Uh, Jeff Hasak was mentioning the issue of the 100 billion yearly commitment. So these there are gaps which remains to be filled, and the challenges ahead of us are huge. But um, my take from um, Glasgow is that the degree of awareness and the commitment to address this issue is much higher than what it used to be. Um, it's probably, and also the perception that time is running out and that um, we really need not only to agree on a net zero objective in 2050, but also or to define or matter. 2070, but define how to get there. And I think that the I mean, we have to work on all areas, um, the financing, and then been some progress on the, the private sector financing, but also the policies at national level um, on having the appropriate framework in that sense. I think that, uh, for example, the issue of carbon price will be absolutely key, because if we want to have more project, if we want to have more, I mean, we really need to incorporate the, um, the uh, side effect or the, the externalities of the carbon and, and the best way to do it is pricing and I think that will have to be part of the agenda. It's very widely discussed now but this will have to be concretely implemented and well, used also as a financial resource. For a moment just for the, since you mentioned, I'm sorry to interrupt you, since you mentioned the issue of carbon pricing, I think that's a very important point also for the sake of our discussion here. Some people say carbon pricing is a fantastic tool to deal with the climate emergency. Others say it is not such a great tool because it puts developing countries, industrializing countries at a disadvantage. How do you see that? Is that a fair way to encourage countries in the industrializing world to actually decarbonize? I think it's a very powerful way to create incentive to decarbonize. Then you can have the discussion whether the price should be at the same level. You know, the, you could, I mean, the IMF pleads for having a sort of a, a range of prices, uh, different prices according to different countries. But price of carbon could also, I mean, some developing countries could have a major asset. We were, I mean, the um, uh, Egypt ministry, Minister Hala El Said was mentioning what Egypt has been doing in renewable. And this is a huge asset for a country mm -hmm. for Egypt with having access to very low level of price for solar and so forth. So carbon price is not necessarily, um, I mean, a disadvantage for some countries. Of course, I mean, in the well, in the way it will be designed, there are a number of options uh, that could be sought of. I know there were also some discussion from developing countries on whether carbon price revenue should be a way to transfer more financing for developing countries. And I think what will be also extremely important, but all at countries level, is how you use the resources coming from this carbon price or carbon tax, because then there will be some people more disadvantaged um, and, and you need to f poorer people will have difficulties uh, to face. And we all, we've seen that in France uh, with a yellow jacket, but I mean, this can be seen everywhere. So I think really thinking very hard about how to ensure that we deal together and we take together the issue of green transition and inequalities will be very important. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. And I think that's a good moment to bring in our our friends and projects leaders here. Sandeep, um, I wanted to throw that question into your court as well. Do you see that there is a contradiction to some extent between decarbonization on the one hand and um, economic development on the other hand. We've seen um, Narendra Modi at, at Glasgow saying, yes, we will also net zero, but only by 2070. By that time, I'll be 93 years old. So uh, um, w what's your take on that? Is, is that an artificial contradiction or is there really something to this argument? 
I think there are different aspects that we need to look at. First of all, let's focus on the issue of opportunities and threats. Uh, on an, from an opportunity standpoint, countries like India can leapfrog. Um, legacy systems may not exist to the extent that they exist in the Western world. And so there is an opportunity to leapfrog from a technology standpoint and from a systemic standpoint. Uh, the flip side of it is uh, we need to create pipes and distribution channels, delivery channels into large populations that exist within the emerging markets. Uh, and until we're able to do that in a way which is meaningful, which means that we will need to include them into the economy, it is going to be very, very difficult to say, let's uh, address the issue of the climate crisis uh, within that context. So sometimes I do get a little uh, perturbed with the idea that, uh, you know, you can put these are two separate problems. Uh, I think in many, many respects, we do need to create the pipes. Uh, and yet at the same time, there is the opportunity to leapfrog uh, given the technological basis. Given the realities of India from an inclusion standpoint, uh, I think uh, we have the potential to lead in many respects, but we also have a significant challenge in terms of making sure that we can bring uh, the, our people, so to speak, within the formal economy so that we can then address basic issues, essential services, demonstrate leadership on that front, uh, and yet leapfrog from a technological standpoint. So that's that's my perception. I don't see these as two separate issues. They're really one issue. If we are inclusive, then we can be green and we can take the climate into consideration. Mm. Thank you very much. Um, I do want to go back to one of our questions from the audience here again. And maybe this is a question for you, Sir Sir Alan. It also refers to COP26. And one of our viewers here asks, at COP26, 130 trillion of private capital was committed um, from 450 firms all over the world to reach net zero by 2050. Given that earlier pledges remained unfulfilled, in particular on the side of the private sector, how optimistic are you that this time the pledge will be fulfilled? And it's a great question. Um, I, I would say a couple of things. Uh, and when you walk away from Glasgow, it's clearly a huge challenge. And is it done? No. <laughs> but is there enormous momentum? The answer is yes. Uh, that 130 trillion was not there a year ago. Mm. This has happened enormously fast. It was an unimaginable number a while ago. And there's a lot to do underneath it and settle it and deliver it, absolutely. But as an indication of momentum, as a statement from the financial uh, services industry in particular, it's a very strong statement. Um, and I think you would say the same from a lot of the corporate uh, commitments that you're seeing. Because they're not just commitments of in 2030 or 2050. Almost all those major companies are now having to say what they're doing this year, what they're doing next year, what they're doing the year after. Um, I, I think you've got to also accept we're living in a world of data, which is unbelievably powerful. Everybody is measurable. Everybody is much clearer about this. There are many less places to hide or fudge. And you'd be very foolish to think that was your strategy mm. if you were a major company. So I think that should give the doubters some, some confidence. The, the one thing I think, and you've done it very well on this panel, actually, is we're not just talking about problems companies have got to meet. And particularly on the projects and in Egypt, you're talking about the opportunity. And, you know, if anybody loves opportunity, it's the corporate world and the world of enterprise from big companies and small to little startups on, on the Elevat. I mean, you, um, and there is enormous opportunity right now in the world. There's an enormous amount of money behind these, whether it's green hydrogen or green financing, we're hearing from all over the place. Um, and, and these two are no longer binary. In the corporate world, it's no longer are we going to make profit or do something socially good or of strong social values. Um, and that, that, that mix of you have to be able to do them together now, it is no longer seen as a binary option. And there is just an enormous amount of excitement in that. People within the organizations, in the same way I was saying that the youth is demanding it of their parents, the younger talent in companies is bringing new ideas, new thinking all the time. So I think it's very easy and quite right to be challenging. We must not step back from any of that natural challenge. Um, and I think it's right to be skeptical and challenging. 
I would caution against being cynical, because actually this is a real feeling, and I think in Glasgow there was so much energy, so much commitment, and real momentum coming into it, and real momentum coming out of it. So this this momentum is is going to last, you think? I, I don't think there's an option, mm. because. I think before this was seen as a long way away, the nature of the dialogue is so different to even two or three years ago. And things like ESG are really metrics from the financial services industry, from the investors for business. They're not driving, but they are permissioning change. They're pushing change. They're, these are quite new pressures that simply were nothing like this before. We've had nothing like this. And I think, so the nature of the conversation has changed. There is a very big risk, if you get it wrong, but there's a, a lot of opportunity, and we're talk, hearing about it in those projects. So I, I think um, that's why I wake up in the morning feeling more like an optimist. Um, but, but, <laughs> that's fantastic. But, but the, you know, we've also surfaced the scale of the challenge. Of course. This is an enormous challenge, and we're a long way from getting it done. And... If we say the mix is government and the private sector, I think there was a great sense of disappointment around government generally in this one, that that wasn't the level of lead. Maybe there will be follow-up, maybe there will be more, but I felt that that balance wasn't as strong as most people would have liked. With all the optimism, that that is a fantastic thing. I also wanted us to look a little bit more on the challenges side of things. And here's a question for for you, Naina. Um, and I, I wanted us to zoom out a little further even and look towards the geopolitical context in which um, these, this in, inflection point that Sir Alan was talking about is happening at, at this point in time. We find ourselves in a geopolitical region reality um, of great power competition, of a global authoritarian drift. So this all contributes to a, a global landscape where finding common solutions, common global solutions to problems such as climate change has become way more complicated. So what do you think, how, how does that kind of macro picture, if you will, how does that affect our ability to build back better also in our own economies at, at home? Wow, that's a, that's a huge question. Yeah, um, sorry. <laughs> uh, well, okay, let me try and let me try and take a stab at it. I, I do think that, you know, there is a lot, one of the sort of drawbacks of the pandemic, especially in our side of the world, has been an increasing inward looking um, sort of trend uh, amongst a lot of governments, amongst a lot of, um, um, you know, sort of uh, political regimes where, you know, because we've all tightly shut borders, we've, we've kind of started controlling who comes in, who goes out. It's, it's obviously had an effect on, on the economies, uh, especially here in, in Asia Pacific. Um, what it's also had is, is, you know, a reluctance to kind of share some of the best practices. And I think, you know, one of the biggest um, elephants in the room is that if you look at If you look at what China has done in the last few years with regards to looking at green instruments, looking at, you know, sort of the um, the partnership between policymakers and financial institutions in that country. In 2015, they had uh, only two green projects. And, you know, by the end of, you know, sort of the year, they had 200. And, and you know, that is what led to the financial um, uh, industry in China being able to invest in in green schemes, in green bonds, in green funds, and they literally went from zero to hero. Now, with some of this kind of closing, not about sharing, and, and, and a geopolitical kind of tint to it, the the best practices or the learning from, from what they did in terms of, you know, the government mandating these kinds of instruments, mandating this kind of investment, and even now sort of looking at the way um, inequality is being addressed, um, is is not something that we we talk about 
whether we talk about it favorably or unfavorably, it's not really shared. Um, the other thing also is that, you know, you need different types of decision makers on the table. I think, um, you know, when you when you talk about investing for climate, you talk about the discussions at COP and, and you know, uh, Sir Alan talked about governments not really stepping up as much as they as they could have. Absolutely. But, you know, it's it's also important to have a more um, equal discussion on climate action and climate justice. And it's important to bring in some of the lower income countries on the table so that they can also uh, be part of that same decision making process. I, I completely agree with you, sir, that you know, I think business is has woken up and has realized that it's time to change. Whether that is coming, whether that is pressure coming from investors, whether that is pressure coming from you know colleagues or 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 new employees who want to join, or whether that is pressure coming from from customers. I think you know business now more than ever is stepping up. The question is, how do we create a multi-sectoral dialogue where you know we actually see everyone kind of taking their share of responsibility, but also, you know, recognizing that there are some countries that are doing this in a better way than others, and how can we actually learn? And maybe partnering on this is better because it's better for the whole world. And if everyone doesn't succeed, no one is going to succeed. Naina, that is the perfect closing statement for this session. I see those big red numbers here running down, which means time is running out um, and it has passed very fast. Thank you all for a very fascinating conversation, both, both here on stage and also online. Keep up the good work that you're all doing. Um, thank you very much also to our audience here in the Grand Al for your active question and for actively listening. Stay with us for the rest of the forum and um, stay with us also in the spirit of the pa Paris Peace Forum. Thank you again and see you all very soon. Goodbye.